So Thais Santos is the design lead at Div Riot. Um, they make a, a design system tool called Backlight. Uh, and I'm sure that she'll tell us more about it. And uh, she also describes herself as a design systems crusader, um, which you know I'm, I'm, I'm sure that does not involve any sort of uh, violence or. <laughs> you never. Know. Never know. Okay, <laughs> we're plugged in. Uh, yes. She's got it. Everyone, give it up for Thais. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Very nice to see you. And I recognize a couple of faces from the workshop we had. Uh, was it yesterday? Two days ago. I'm already lost in time. My name is Thais Santos. Thank you so much for the pronunciation. You did it so well. That's how I usually describe my name for people because when they see it, especially in Europe, uh, it's a little bit difficult. Uh, but yeah, that's how you pronounce my name. And I work with design systems since 2019. And once I dove into this world, really, I just never left. Uh, I have a background in product design, but I do like to dabble in code from time to time. And I am originally from Brazil, but I live in the Netherlands. And about this talk, we are going to cover um, some major um, points that actually Mo touched on a, a lot. But I want to bring to you guys a designer's perspective. And that would mean also uh, emphasizing the importance of design systems, because as uh, Jenny mentioned it, I am a crusader, so I want to convince everybody that uh, they should implement design systems in their products. Um, and what do I mean by universal? Also, I'm going to set uh, or explain to you guys a set of guiding principles and some challenges that comes with that. So we can never highlight it too much, the design system importance. In the end, it's a cohesive experience for the end user. And that's what designers have in the back of their minds uh, when they are thinking about creating user flows. They need, it needs to go from what you experience on web into your iOS and uh, Android applications. It's also very efficiently to have a design system when you're building the project. Um, for example, for designers, it means they have libraries that they can just drag and drop uh, elements and make, make up their wireframes and make up their high fidelity prototypes. The same for developers. You don't have to rewrite pieces of code uh, that uh, would perform exactly the same throughout different flows. And ultimately, it's scalability for the business. For example, if you want to implement a light and a dark theme, a design system enables you that. You don't have to rebuild your entire application. The same for designers. So it's very important. And what do I mean by universal? Um, I like to define, like, a collection of resources that aid in developing a uniform application across various platforms, web, iOS, and Android. So Mo uh, explained his perspective, um, and it could be more of a shared code base that would mean you get to apply the same application for all these different platforms. From a designer's perspective, it means I want the applications to look and feel similar across these applications. I'm actually a little bit more prone um, uh, using the native platforms to build the code. So I wouldn't go for something like a React Native to apply this uh, product across the platforms. I would go and build natively on iOS and Android. But that usually means uh, more resources and dedicated uh, development uh, infrastructure. For designers, it means I have to work in three separate files. And this is an arbitrary number. 25% of popular design systems include mobile components. So when you go around understanding about design systems and using uh, what's out there in the industry, you probably heard material design. You probably heard about carbon. These big ones, they do explain what are the guidelines. And they have components that you can apply in native or um, emulated uh, mobile applications. But it's not all of them. There are many design systems that you can use at the, as a base for your um, project. And let's say 75% actually doesn't give you guidance on how to make the, those mobile components. When we talk about making it visual or visualizing your application in a mobile uh, device, it's not about just responsiveness, right? It's about everything that Mo explained it in his presentation. So, Let's start with our guiding principles. And this is based on my own experience with other UXers when we were defining products in the previous companies that we worked at. And we can start off with the most basic, important one, the foundations. 
It's the brand definitions that should be the same value across all platforms. The color should be the same, the spacing, roundness, iconography. Your brand needs to be recognizable if it's a web application, an iOS and an Android application. That can be achieved with design tokens, and I think most demo is perfect. That's exactly what it is. And if you give that power to the designer to be in charge of these decisions through design tokens applications, then it's even better, because every little detail about the brand can be updated, and the communication throughout the process goes really quick. Like he showed, you can use a plugin like uh, Token Studios, and everything in a pipeline gets already updated in production much quicker. A couple of years ago, this would take a longer time. And actually, that's probably why you're seeing some, um, like the examples that he gave on GitHub being so many colors, is because of different design decisions ju that just pop up as different flows are being developed. You know, this designer feels like this blue is now not conveying the message as it should. So when you set a design tokens foundations, it actually enables you for this consistency across platforms. And it's across um, experiences as well within the same product. So I would highly encourage you from a designer's perspective to invest in setting up a good design tokens infrastructure because on the long term, it really pays off. For example, if you actually need to update your brand, Two years down the line, the roundness of your buttons doesn't make sense anymore. The trend now is everything being super squared. With design tokens, you're able to do that much quicker. You don't have to redo everything. The guiding principle number two, and you probably noticed that I didn't mention before in the foundations, typography being one of them. That is because this is the one tricky part about being universal design systems and handling web and mobile applications. Typography is actually one that you probably should choose for the platforms but typography. In iOS, it means San Francisco as a typeface, and Android is Roboto. And why is that? Well, faster loading time, definitely. Your brand might have a typography that it's beautiful and it works really well on web, but to load that on your mobile applications, uh, it's a little bit tricky. Also, these uh, typographies that come from natively from the applications, they uh, are already catered for different screen resolutions. So we have Androids of all sorts, and the font adapts really nicely. And that goes in the same um, area of type scaling. So the dynamic type, for those who are not familiar, when you need to access accessibility settings of your phone, your typography will adapt nicely. The proportions of the type are already uh, done to uh, readability. And if, you're, if you have a custom font, you probably don't think of those nuances of those different sizes between um, fonts. So using the typography from the platform, it actually makes it much easier. It covers all the issues with accessibility, which also includes the support for alternative languages. So you might not have the accents and little uh, different things that you need to think about when defining typography. Guiding principle number three platform-specific guidelines. So the user expects certain components due to the familiarity to the device. And that goes in the example from all with the alert that popped up, right? If you need an alert about uh, show location on the map in the web, you get that little box. You can style that to your brand and make it look nice. And you might not want to push that to your devices. Stick to what the device shows, because that means the user doesn't have to think too much about what is it that they're seeing. So it's, it's a little bit tricky from a design perspective because one of the main or the first guiding principle is keep your brand consistent. Keep showing the things exactly the same throughout the products. But actually, this is where it starts differing from what you do as a design system and also what you do catering to, this, to the user. You want the user to be familiar and to feel comfortable with your application. And for that, I have a nice quote from Don Norman. Familiarity is the foundation upon which intuitive interaction is built, enabling us to effortlessly navigate and master the complexities of technology. So Don Norman, he wrote the book, the, the Design of Everyday Things, and it's kind of like the Bible for designers. It's really good to think about some of the key subtle rules that we need to apply in our digital products as well. So that's why you would, um, from a designer's perspective, and hopefully for you guys as a developer as well, choose to favor what comes from the platform. So 
don't be shy to actually push back on designs, right? You might get a handoff from your designer showing this beautiful flow with all these amazing components that look exactly like the web. And you should highlight to them, look, we have this in iOS. Maybe we should go for that. That could be a, a better way to keep things familiar to the end user. Guiding principle number four. Well, component behavior. In this example, I have a search box. So you should define and validate the visual interaction cues to ensure that they conform to the platform expected standards. Say, if you want to clear your search on web, normally you would do it with an X uh, icon that shows up on the right corner. But for Android and iOS, they had their own behavior. That search box behaves with a cancel button, for example, that is always displaying. And um, an Android, actually, you also get that little icon that shows up only once you start typing. So the component behavior, you don't have to rethink it or redesign it when you're making this design system for uh, all the platforms. You, might, you want to stick to, OK, normal good behavior in web includes these but let's stick to what's native to the, platform, to the mobile platforms. And number five, I would say user-centric design. Conduct user research, usability test, and gather feedback. That's at the base of any uh, product designing, really. You want to know what the user is doing with your product. So if you're in the process of setting up your design system and you came up with all these components that maybe differ a little bit from the platform, and you found enough reasons to do so, well, put it in the hands of the user. See if that's actually how they're going to behave or they're going to interact with that component as you expect it. It's part of a design process, but I would encourage developers as well. When you are actually putting into uh, implementation something that you got from uh, your designer, just put it in the end of a couple of users. See where it goes. See if they behave, um, if they click where they should have clicked. And number six, interaction patterns. So we talked about how the components have their specific behaviors, but the interaction pattern, patterns can go also further. It can be about the navigation, right? So when you're defining a navigation for web, you can use tabs, for example. And in Android and iOS, you have a similar idea of tabs, but especially for iOS in this example, it's quite different. We use a thing called segmented control. So again, you should leverage the user's existing familiarity with the standard UI patterns in their respective platform, reducing the cognitive load and enhancing usability. It goes back to familiarity. But this also means that now you need to provide, as a designer, some good explanation that if this navigation pattern is being used in web with a tab, we are using this with um, the segmented control on iOS. And it's because of usability. It's because the, the iOS users know how to interact with this kind of thing. If they see a tab in, in their phones, they might not even know that they should be clicking on it. And this brings me to some other examples. I put together here just a set of components that you would see on web, iOS, and Android from the same brand. You can see very clearly that the primary colors are consistent. The shape of the buttons as well for its roundness, but the button on web is actually just enough for the size of the word, whilst on the mobile, it's actually full width. And these are some of the nuances because, yes, users are now in the um, mobile phones. They need more space for clicking on that button, for example. So accessibility has to be taken into account when defining how these different components look in different platforms. But some other things, you can just keep it as is, right? An avatar can look exactly the same as what you have on web. So you're building a set of reusable elements for making new screens very easy to um, build quickly and test and iterate on. So everything that a platform already gives you, make use of that. Everything that your web design system can provide to the mobile devices, also. And you will end up with quite a big set of assets, but it's good. Finally, um, well, I have nine guiding principles, and this is number seven, collaboration and communication. Make sure, as a designer, and this is my message to designers out there, involve all types of developers in the design process to ensure the feasibility and practicability of your design decisions. So you might want to change that little um, dialog box a little bit, use the primary color on the button, but you might ask your developer, is this a good idea? Should we do it this way? 
building a universal design system means you have to talk to all these uh, cross-functional uh, teams. From my perspective, I like to dabble in code from time to time, so it's quite easy for me to interact with a front-end developer. And once we started in a previous company trying to implement the same exact looking design system into mobile applications, it became a li little bit trickier to talk to iOS developers and Android developers, simply because this idea of components or even the CSS structure is just different. So I would encourage um, designers to really try to understand how they communicate, what are their um, wording for components, what do they understand as a component because this is what it's going to make a one set of design, design system components reusable across platforms. Number eight, documentation and guidelines. So you could say that having design tokens and having components is having a design system. Well, I would say that's just a library. To have a design system, you need your documentation, you need your guidelines. Provide resources where code snippets and examples for implementation on different platforms can be easily accessed by the teams. It usually means that your product that uses the design system needs to make that available in a separate website. You need a whole infrastructure, and hopefully you have a design system team to set that up for you. But in a lot of the cases, there is not enough investment just for a dedicated design system. So hopefully you guys here can learn a little bit and implement this, even if you're not fully dedicated to design systems. Having a documentation guideline is what is gonna emphasize that you need to reuse these components. I think it, it will still happen that designers will design, recreate new little squares uh, where it should have been a component, and developers might recreate that piece of code, but foster this idea of reading the guidelines and the documentation. And finally, it's an iterative improvement, right? Regularly update and refine your components based on user insights, emerging design trends, and platform updates. So the segmented control is an example for iOS. Maybe in a couple of versions down the line, that's not a common pattern anymore. Maybe they decided to slightly change the style. Does it still fit your brand? Does it still fit your application? And you will have to get that information updated into your design libraries. And that's really important to keep improving. A design system is not static. It needs to keep going. Finally, a universal design system for designers usually means these four assets. We have, in essence, uh, four files that work together for milk making up design um, handovers. So we have the foundations files that includes the design tokens, and if you already set it up with such a plugin like Token Studio, great. You will have there your logos and illustrations, your typography, anything related to the brand will be inside foundations. And that usually is what cascades down to these other three files. You will probably have a web library that includes all the components needed to build a web version of your application. And the iOS and Android library, which will have some components that look like what you see in the web library, but then they also have their iOS specific components and their fonts. So it's really good that, um, for example, with Figma, you get files that are distributed in the community. So designers don't actually have to recreate every uh, UI element of these platforms every time. We can reuse what some other people make it available. It's really handy. But it needs to be updated. You need to construct it in a good way for, for your use in your design files. And it's a lot of maintenance. Imagine, now we have to keep these three in parity at all times. So there are some other plugins and tools that you can use to keep sure, making sure that things are matching. And ideally, this all should match also what has in code. The design tokens would be the first place to start on keeping things aligned. But there are still a lot of things about having these little assets in your files that you're going to have to do it manually. And Tim Cook said, or at least I found this quote, <laughs> and I thought it was interesting. Applications don't need to look the same across platforms. They need to work the same. So don't be afraid that visually maybe it's not reflecting exactly your brand in all aspects. Maybe that roundness you expected from um, the alert should be a little bit different, but you're sticking to the platform specifics. In the end, it's about the user experience. And what design systems are here to help both designers and developers is to get past the UI, go quickly through that and focus on how the user interacts with your product. 
And in conclusion, universal design systems are worth it. I really think they are. It creates a seamless and unified experience for the end user while considering platform familiarity. It boosts teams' productivity and efficiency while also facilitating business scalability and growth. Hopefully, this presentation gave you some insights. If you need to push back on product managers and promote the idea of having a design system that works for all the cross-functional uh, teams, here were the guiding principles for you to use it. Tell your designers that uh, they should take these things into consideration, but yourselves as developers, you should um, make sure that you have enough resources to push back on some decisions that might not make sense for that platform that you're working in. So that was about it. Thank you.